elder dragons are the meat of high and master rank monster hunting. Without their additional abilities, they still remain beasts of great power and peril. With them, they're often compared to natural disasters. The lore around elders is murky and excessive, some claiming them to be a mere step above wyverns, and others bestowing them with world-ending powers. But how much of this could be true, and how much is just the usual hyperbole that comes with any animal attack? How much could just be a part of the many mysteries of the Monster Hunter world? Well, let's start by taking a look at one of the best-known elders, Kushala Deora. Obviously, the first question anyone may have with any elder is, are some of the more fantastic abilities possible? But with Kushala's most fanciful ability of controlling storms, this doesn't seem very likely. The senior ecologist really doubts that Kushala actually controls the weather. And of course, it doesn't actually utilise this feature in-game, either against the hunter or other hostile elders. There's also no real mention of it in Dive Into Monster Hunter World. And the in-game description merely says it's an association with storms. Whilst it definitely can create some very impressive wind currents, that with a dash of hyperbole can easily transform into the belief of weather control in various cultures, true storm control ultimately doesn't seem like something Kushala can really do. But still, one thing that can't really be denied is that Kushala is still associated with severe weather fronts. It's mentioned some civilizations believed it was a storm god. Doss's opening also shows it travelling in storm conditions too. So why may any animal choose to be most active when the weather is at its worst, or even deliberately follow storms? Well, it may be that it's to forage. In a study of surplus killing in mammalian carnivores, it was found that it most typically happens in rare incidents where the anti-predator behaviour of the prey is hamstrung somehow. The two most prevalent instances of this were on dark or stormy nights. For a mixed colony of black-headed gulls and terns, adverse weather conditions on very dark nights made controlled flight impossible, and so the birds instinctively hunkered down to avoid getting blown away, or risking damaging themselves if they couldn't see to land. Foxes that arrived at the colony could predate them at will, killing up to 230 birds in a night. On another similar night, the author himself walked down to the colony, and found that he could pick up and handle the birds without them making any attempt at escape. And it isn't just birds, either. In his later study of spotted hyenas, a group of 19 hyenas killed over 80 gazelles, and wounded dozens more, far more than they could eat. A tropical storm had blown in and soaked the local savanna, and it seemed that the gazelles that were normally dependent on their high speed to flee were unwilling to run in the slippery, muddy conditions that they'd likely struggle to get purchase in. So Kushala may deliberately associate with storms for the rich pickings that come with it. Whilst Elder Dragons do eat a lot of straight mineral content, it also seems that they do require energetic fuel for their bodies too, as well as just generally being well built for predation. So it can be assumed that Kushala will both readily eat meat and function as a predator to attain it. This may be one of its chief reasons for following storms. High wind speeds may ground even large wyverns, and whilst they almost certainly won't be so meek as the terns, there's no doubt they'll be far easier to attack and take down if they can't take wing. Similarly, herbivores or other ground-dwelling animals may struggle to flee in the rain-soaked terrain, and will be far easier captured by the Elder Dragon. This storm-chasing behaviour may also explain the huge ranges and variety of habitats it's found in across its range as it follows them. Of course, this isn't to say that Kushala can only hunt in storms, or that it has a 100% success rate in locating and following them. It's more to just try and explain the association. It may also be that certain minerals become more accessible in storm conditions. The rain could wash away dirt and unearth ore deposits, or some mineral-rich patches of earth soaked by the water may become malleable and edible, whereas it's stone-hard and difficult to handle in the dry season. It's suggested Kushala's horns are complex organs that may control its wind-related powers, but it's also possible that they're delicate sensory organs detecting minute changes in pressure and humidity that direct Kushala to storm fronts for better hunting. The near-constant appearance of Kushala alongside storms then leads to the cultural belief it can create them. And this isn't uncommon with animals. In our own world, once upon a time stag beetles were associated with storms, and believed to be in league with Thor, able to generate their own lightning bolts, or that if you killed one, a thunderstorm would follow. In reality, stag beetles come out on humid evenings, at the end of summer when thunderstorms are frequent, 
and they prefer to live in the giant solitary oaks that would be most likely to be struck by lightning. But it shows how these beliefs can form, and as well as Kushala, it's interesting to imagine what other cultural or mythological properties the people of the world of Monster Hunter may hold about the various animals they live with. One ability it can't be denied Kushala has control over is the vortex surrounding its body it can create. As well as the occasional blasts of air emanating from it, it can create and also effectively fly in its own miniature hurricane. This can be strong enough to dispel arrows and explosive launched at it, and repel hunters coming in for any melee attacks. Is this possible, and does anyone fly like this? Unlike a lot of the more extreme Elder Dragon behaviours where the answer would usually be no, this time it's actually more of a sort of. Bumblebees can actually fly, despite concerns of the physicists of yesteryear, but with such tiny wings for their body size, their confusion was justified. But how do they do it? To put it badly, bumblebees fly not by moving their wings up and down, but forwards and backwards. They do this incredibly quickly, and it creates a leading edge vortex. The pressure in this vortex is much lower than the surrounding air, and so generates the lift for the insect and sufficient amounts of it to keep them airborne. A leading edge vortex is effectively a similar process to stirring a drink, and anything you add as it's stirred is sucked into the vortex created by your stirring. So a bee's wing and flight is maybe more similar to those of a propeller or a rotor on a helicopter than the wing of a plane which pushes air underneath it for lift. It could almost be said it creates a mini hurricane around itself to generate lift, if you want to get a bit colourful. This is a bit of a rough explanation, and it's probably quite flawed if you actually like physics, but we play the cards we're dealt and I'm a biologist, so it'll have to do for now. But maybe this is something similar to what Kushala does. It does have both large wings and uniquely broad ones too. They have a very unusual shape compared to most of the flying animals in Monster Hunter. Maybe this, combined with a unique stroke pattern, creates a low pressure vortex around Kushala's whole body when in flight. Obviously, there are some big limitations of lore versus gameplay here. We can clearly see in-game, Kushala flies with the same animation of other Elder Dragons, and he doesn't beat his wings any faster than them either. But whilst for now at least the in-game animations are limited, this could at least provide a possible lore explanation for it. For Kushala to throw his tornadoes, for want of a better word, is considerably less likely. I guess it's not impossible for it to push an air current with the vortex away from itself, and bumblebees create independent vortices for each wing, but without the beat of his wings continuing to generate the conditions for it, it would likely fade in seconds. So some of his more extreme tornado generating abilities are pretty impossible to explain outside of fiction. There's also the generation of the blasts of wind it produces when stationary too. These seem to emanate from the chest when you watch Kushala, and the ridges in the armour do almost seem reminiscent of spiracles, the way insects do their gas exchange. Kushala may not breathe through this, but it's possible it may have pockets, for want of a better word, between the metal skin and the tissues beneath. Kushala seems to have a very powerful diaphragm, with great control over it, and when not using it to expel air from the mouth, it may be able to retract the muscles on its ventral surface to draw air in, before rapidly forcing it out to create these regular blasts of air. The powerful diaphragm is also likely the key component in forcing out the air blasts necessary to send a hunter flying. Kushala is a big animal, with a large torso and a deep chest, and presumably an impressive set of lungs inside it. I'm unsure of the exact pressure needed to knock a human off their feet, but at a glance it seems like it could be quite possible. As curious as these abilities are, what's equally puzzling is what exactly they're used for. The personal hurricane created by its flight could be a side effect of the wing strokes, rather than intentional, but the stationary blasts created from its chest are a pretty odd thing to do, especially considering they likely take some effort to constantly produce. A possible explanation could be that this is some territorial marking behaviour, Kushala could have scent glands in his ventral pockets, that disperse an aerosolized pheromone or protein to warn other animals of its presence, or to communicate with other Kushala, especially helping them find each other in the breeding season. The skin of a Kushala deora is said to be metal, and is often compared to steel. As implausible as this may sound, this is actually well represented in nature. Perhaps the best analogue for Kushala is the scaly foot gastropod, an astonishing deep sea snail that incorporates iron sulfides into both its overall shell and the sclerites to protect its foot as well. 
So just as Kushala does it, it literally protects itself in metal plates. And overall, this shouldn't be too huge a surprise. Biomineralization is pretty universal across Animalia. It's just less flashy because we so often think of metal as a purely man-made substance, and not something naturally occurring. Your calcium bones are made via biomineralization, as is the shell of a snail in your garden or the carapace of a crab. But these aren't shiny in metal, so they're not talked about with the same amazement. It's believed this ability evolved in the snail due to the high concentrations of sulfur it lives in. Without any way to regulate its intake, it'd be poisoned by it. The symbiotic bacteria that feed it also require this sulfur, and it's suggested that over time it secreted this into its shell to assist in predator defense from the crabs who also live on the geothermal mounds. Perhaps this gives some clues about the how and the why a similar ability arose in Kushala Deora, and how some of the elders attained their powers. At certain points in the Earth's history, there have been periods of huge, long-lasting volcanicity, constant eruptions lasting for millennia, belching out toxic gases that poisoned much organic life. They cooled the planet and turned the seas to acid. Maybe elder dragons are aptly named, and are akin to sharks in our own world, top-order organisms that predate much of what we know from even prehistory. Some elders may originate in a time from the planet's history of geological turmoil, with no choice but to adapt to a toxic atmosphere, before man or wyvern or even the most basal of leviathans. Their ability to harness the compounds in the atmosphere to survive allowed them to percolate fire from their manes, hold court over pestilence, or even forge their skin into armour. Some even became the volcanoes themselves. Elders may be the survivors of these great dying events from millennia past. The only animals with the capability to withstand and exploit such conditions, and now use their extraordinary abilities to rule the world as it's now known. But of course, much of this is speculation, and hyperbolic speculation too. Certain elders like Camellios likely would have perished in such conditions, and seem to acquire little benefit from minerals. If elders are at least partially carnivorous, they'd also need a reasonable amount of something else to survive as food. But it is interesting to postulate that some of their abilities may be analogous to the scaly foot gastropod, in that they were forged in and due to incredibly hostile conditions, likely volcanic areas or periods of activity. Their rule over the world is also pretty hotly contested by man and wyvern alike too. It's also equally possible that they're just not that ancient. They simply evolved to live in more hostile environments like volcanic regions. As well, it also begs the question of how the elders maintain these abilities in the world, after its equivalent of either the Deccan or Siberian traps. It doesn't seem likely it's ongoing, or would have a whole world of iron-plated monsters. But this is easily answered by the elder habit of directly eating minerals. Teostra is fond of gunpowder, which is sulfur, carbon, and potassium nitrate. The first two may also be important minerals for Kushala to create its armour. They are for the scalyfoot gastropod after all. What began as a detoxification process, now continues as a deliberate behaviour, to retain extraordinary abilities. In earlier games, Kushala would also go to eat at the mining spots too, presumably for the mineral content. This in turn likely explains the prevalence of elders around volcanic areas. The raw, exposed rock freshly turned out from the earth provides a banquet of assorted minerals, as well as the unearthing of ores that may be hard to find otherwise or not be present in other areas. This may be the reason for the elder crossing, and explain the dragons involved. Kushala, Teostra, and Lunastra are the ones likely most dependent on regular mineral consumption. The Elder Crossing may not be random and increasing, but actually in time with seismic events the dragons can detect, that ensure large amounts of rare or high quality minerals to feed on. Camellios, Valhazak, and Shagru Magala may not be as dependent on it, if they even eat minerals, and Nurkagante likely gets at least some of his from other Elders, as well as living in volcanic areas himself. The notion of eating mineral rock straight up may sound weird, but we do this ourselves pretty much daily. Every time you salt your food, you're adding the vital rocks you need for energy transfer in your body. It's just that they're quite small, and they tend to dissolve into the food as well so you're not literally crunching up a boulder. Animals themselves will make long treks for certain caves or earth patches to eat salt too. The Elder Crossing may just be a similar thing but on a much larger scale. Thanks to their unique skin, Kushala can become more dangerous at certain times when they're rusted. 
this fits so they'd be more difficult to take down, as they're effectively wearing two layers of armour at this point. Kushala may also become more aggressive at this time due to the stresses of molting. One of the ideas in the original art book that may or may not still be canon is that Kushala entering senescence experienced skeletonizing of the skin. When this process is complete, the Kushala dies. Molting in general is a costly procedure, and some suggest it can kill around 10 to 15% of adult lobsters, with each molt getting more energetically expensive the older and larger the lobster gets. So the idea of a sealed in kill switch isn't so far fetched, and this really is just what senescence is. It happens to us as our bodies age. We just don't have such a striking visual reputation of it because our skin doesn't turn to metal and rust over. The process of a Kushala malt is very swift by malt standards, as is the hardening of the new skin, presumably to protect against aggressive competitors and harsh conditions. It's worth noting this lends some possible credence to the ventral pockets theory too. Insects use their spiracles to expand themselves further and rupture the old exoskeleton. Crustaceans in the sea take on more water. Kushala is limited in rupturing its own exoskeleton by the size of its lungs, but it's possible it could use a system like the ventral pockets to push air under the old exoskeleton and then trap it for the split. After all, there's a visible and audible release of gas when it occurs. Another way Kushala differs itself from quite a few other elders is that it actually has some attacks that visually use dragon element. So let's also discuss what Dragon Element could be, how it functions, how it evolved, and how it may be used. First, what do we actually know? Dragon is a bioluminescent substance that blights its opponents. It gives off a black vapour seemingly as a waste product, and whilst there is a red light produced by the chemical reaction making it, it doesn't necessarily produce large amounts of heat. In large quantities in direct exposure, or via prolonged exposure, it can cause cellular degradation to the point of death. Despite this, some animals can still be completely immune to its effects. It's often suggested to cause madness, or a lack of cognition, but this isn't really supported by anything concrete. It can also seemingly weaken elder dragons, and some suggest it makes them unable to use their abilities too. It can also be blocked easily by solid objects, and once created, lasts for minutes at most. One of the things I was tempted to say that it might be a type of weird, organically produced ionising radiation, but the more I think about it, I feel this may be unlikely. If it can be blocked by solid surfaces, this would make it similar to an alpha or beta particle, which are wildly lethal if ingested. Gamma particles are better able to permeate surfaces, but are far less dangerous when they do to organic life. If dragon can be blocked, this should mean it should be a guaranteed kill once it does reach you, or anything. It also has an insanely short half-life if this is the case. Another theory could be that it's a type of weird bioluminescent bacteria. Viewer Dr. Maziaka suggested one similar to the Alivibrio fisheri that's found in symbiosis with marine organisms. This easily explains the glowing, although it's hard to imagine a bacteria so insanely virulent it so quickly affects its opponents. Overall, the more I think about it, the more tempted I am to go for a cop-out answer and say it's a unique form of energy produced in the Monster Hunter world without an analogue in ours. Now that I've not answered what Dragon Element is, the next biggest question may be its function. From some info in the World Art Book, I believe the key reason Dragon Element exists and is produced is for immune function. Now I know this may not be the epic badass explanation many were hoping for, but epic badass weapons in nature very rarely have epic badass origins. Poison dart frogs with sufficient toxins to kill a whole herd of elephants didn't evolve said toxin to predate whole herds of elephants, but to protect itself from a species in an evolutionary arms race that was developing a resistance to its toxins. It's suggested elders contain dragon element in their blood. This may be the unique substance that older games suggested elder dragons possess in their blood too. And if so, this means it's produced by the bone marrow. This is where the immune defence of most vertebrates comes from, as it's where we produce our white blood cells that attack pathogens and foreign bodies that enter our own. This may be why elder dragons are immune to frenzy virus, where other animals of similar physical power aren't. Dragon element may function in elder blood like our own immune system, just more potent. Any foreign bodies or pathogens that enter are swiftly degraded and destroyed by the element, making elders near enough immune to most diseases. 
Using dragon offensively against them may be akin to briefly causing an autoimmune-like function, where their body has too much of it, but rather than doing something stupid like a juice cleanse, they just let their body regulate itself. But it can still have initially and temporarily harmful effects. But what about other animals that use dragon element? Well, it seems other animals don't use it in the same way. It doesn't seem like it's produced in their bone marrow, but it's produced in a specialised organ. As for why this organ doesn't poison their whole bodies, it may be similar to our own stomachs. We have an organ that produces acid strong enough to digest most of our tissues, but it's also specialised enough to keep that acid safe inside itself. Some also don't produce the element itself. Stygian Zenoga is dependent on Dracophage bugs. It seems likely that Devil Joe and Ebony Odogaron have a specialised organ that keeps it safe inside them for the most part. But with that said, Devil Joe does seem to flood its major muscle tissues with dragon element when it gets enraged. It's likely that Devil Joe only does this for short periods, because to keep this up would be toxic to its tissues. In regards to Frenzy, it's hard to say why this doesn't wipe out the virus, but it's worth noting that dragon element also has a short half-life. Devil Joe may also not use dragon for long enough and extensively enough over its body to completely wipe out the virus. Savage Devil Joe is immune to Frenzy presumably due to the fact it literally has 24-hour dragon element pumping through its whole body. Unfortunately for it though, this doesn't just wipe out the virus, this ultimately seems to degrade the tissues and probably ultimately kill it as well. Odogron and Devil Joe may have likely evolved it for a similar reason. Both are animals that frequent large carcasses, and are likely regular scavengers. It's possible the origins of their dragon element started with boosting immune function, and then became later used for weakening large prey via attrition. This also may explain why both are described as so hungry all the time. Dragon may have a very high mineral cost to produce. This is also why elder dragons regularly take the nutritional shortcut of feeding straight on the mineral rocks, often in large quantities. Unable to do so, or it not being an innate behaviour for them, Odogron and Devil Joe are so ravenous not because of energetic needs, but due to the need to consume enough bone and organ to satisfy the mineral cost of sustaining dragon element. Why elders are the only ones to develop this when there are open mineral deposits across the world is unknown, but maybe it has something to do with lifespan. Elder dragons will of course be young at points in their lives, but it seems from reputation and title and the enormous size of some of them that elders may live longer than wyverns, whose lifespans may be more similar to giant theropods. They grow quickly, they live fast, and they often die young. In massive long-lived animals, there is a phenomenon known as Pito's Paradox, or why giant animals don't get cancer when they should be riddled with it. It's worth noting it's still unknown exactly what goes on here to prevent such illnesses. That's why it's still a paradox. But for elders, we may have our answer. Maybe with their large size and long lifespans, the use of dragon element for superb immune function is the monster hunter equivalent to whatever the reason is behind Pito's paradox. Elders may also just be akin to crocodiles in our world, where they have a wildly effective immune system, but no one has really been able to point out exactly how it functions just yet. If we don't have the technology to figure such things out in our own world, dragon element will likely remain a bizarre mystery for some time. So that was the first Elder video. It took a while to get here, but I'll likely do more. Elders appear so rarely on this channel because as you can imagine it's quite hard to find real world analogues for a lot of their abilities. I'm keen to hear everyone's thoughts on Dragon Element, and I'll await to see what the comments say to see if I gave Kushala a fair shake. Or of course if I'm a beta cuck for failing to use peer reviewed sources to rationally explain an oversized tin pot lizard that can recreate Hurricane Katrina at will. To briefly give my thoughts on Elders, I'd actually like to see them taken down a peg. Despite their more extreme abilities, as turf wars and interactions in cutscenes become more prevalent, it's harder and harder to justify them being such legends. Whilst they do have amazing abilities, with the various things they can produce from their body, their physical strength isn't that much to write home about. They often struggle to restrain other large monsters. Various wyverns don't actually fear them, we have it in writing various wyverns are also physically on par or even superior to them and we see monsters tank things like explosions that are often the X factor they produce anyway. A world with more tough wars and interactions is cooler than one with the jalapeno lizards put on a pedestal away from everyone else. Plus, in the early games too, they didn't even start on this pedestal. They were just monsters like everyone else. Something like Rathalos vs. Teostra would be considered an interesting match in 2006. 
But I know not everyone agrees with this, and some would actually like it to go in the opposite direction, they'd rather have them even more powerful. So by all means, sound off in the comments. For my thoughts on Kushala, I definitely feel I don't hate it as much as some of the fanbase do. As the face of Monster Hunter DOS, he was something everyone was really excited to fight when he came to the West in Portable 2. All the Elders were, really. They were this new and exciting class of monster, more like traditional dragons, and we were chomping at the bit to see them. And when they arrived, I'd actually say they delivered. Back in Portable 2, you actually had low-rank village elders, so they weren't hideously difficult. Plus, the repel mechanic letting you break them up over two fights actually made them far easier than the meaty damage sponges like Black Diablos or Gravios. With the wind ability, it was also kind of annoying then still, but then ailments were much more valid in combat back then. As an aside, I feel they've gotten effectively useless in more recent games, but back in the earlier titles, they were still pretty powerful up until G-Rank, but I digress. With a lot of Elder Dragon hunts, you were also given poisoned throwing knives, and so you could eliminate the wind or fire barrier enough to destroy their horns most times too. Kushala still flew a lot, but it was more hovering so you could still bite his kneecaps and do damage. Overall, I remember him as quite a reasonable fight for most of the time, it's actually quite odd they made him regarded as so obnoxious in World, but luckily restored in Rise. In terms of design, I think he's one where the simplicity kind of works. In a series that when he was introduced had so few typical European dragons, it was nice to have at least one. Plus the metallic skin, the mammal-like feature of legs being under the body, and the broader, more butterfly-like wings gave him a unique edge. In terms of his theme, I always quite liked it, and I really liked the notes of despair in the middle too which felt very fitting for something you thought that was constantly making the environment a much more miserable place to be in. When it was remixed in World though, I absolutely loved it, and it became one of my top favourites. So all in all, I think it's quite fair to say I do quite like Kushala Deora. Thanks for watching, and thanks to all of you especially who watched the last video too. I'm glad you managed to persevere through all two hours of it, and I can only hope the wait was worth it. And worry not, things are now roughly back to normal for the schedule, for now at least. Elder Dragons are quite a difficult group of animals for this style of video, so I am genuine when I say I want to know people's thoughts on how this one was. Quite a few of them have received requests, and I do plan to do more. They just require a lot more thought in trying to find good parallels. As ever, if this is your first video and you enjoyed it, consider subscribing for more. And if you're already subscribed, I hope this one was worthy of your likes and sharing with friends. And now for the teaser for next week's video.